welcome everyone. I think we have had a long journey from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and today is the last day. So everyone can enjoy tomorrow, Friday, trying to remember everything I've tried to explain and give like, well, just some background on and just the basics. And on the topic of, you know, we started with the instruments, we went into remote sensing, and then yesterday we looked at um, water quality. And in the spirit of water quality, and one of the topics I'm really interested in, or what I'm really actually doing, and what well, I do almost every day, is plastic litter. And I think everyone in the watching or listening is also interested in plastic litter. Um, okay, so just a quick recap of, um, let's see, how can I, this is still on top of my screen, give me a second, how do I hide this, uh, how can I hide the, the top layer, uh, I can, okay, anyway, so I'll continue. So recap, uh, because it's hiding the titles, I want to see this uh, thing. <laughs> uh, just a second, uh, I'm trying to remove this, I don't want to see this. Okay, so, um, yeah, I'll continue then, because I tried to hide this, but it seems it cannot be removed. Um, so, a recap, it's on ocean instruments. I hope now you have an idea of why we study the ocean, like what I spoke about yesterday, and the different ocean parameters, and the platforms we use, and instruments we are using. And also, again, just to give you that impression of the different... We don't see this Yeah, okay. Um, uh, and then you have ships and uh, different icebreakers. And also we talked about remote sensing, what is marine optics, what platforms can you perform remote sensing from, and a recap on like the different tools, the classic tools, and the most advanced tools we have these days. And then, yeah, now on the topic of water quality, what we discussed more on what is optical water quality, why is water quality important? How we determine water quality or how do we measure it? And then of course, one of the biggest challenges for uh, water surrounded people, uh, communities or like um, citizens is eutrophication when you have blooms and uh, how it affects the aquatic life and the human life. Um, yeah, so here I gave you examples of like the, some of the activities that are affected, especially fishing and then, you know, like recreational activities, kayaking, fishing uh, and swimming. And then, of course, the aquatic life, which is also one source of income for like different communities. And then you have drinking water. The water quality is always very important. And then tourism. And one thing we try to explain um, when we are doing science and also when we are doing water quality they are you have to understand that there is qualitative data and quantitative data and just remember qualitative quality and then quantitative is quantity so you put a number when you're talking about quantitative data and it's objective and then you have subjective parameters that are quality which is either good bad or okay some 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 of those like uh, qualitative um, phrases and then we try to s explain that water quality is the state of the natural water body. And I gave an example of human health, you know, like you can either quantify it or qualify it by measuring body temperature and other um, parameters like blood pressure, or you can just say, I feel okay, I feel cold. And then the major parameters we measure are physical, chemical, and biological. And based on the sustainable development goals, I proposed that, you know, like the most relevant um, par um, goals that are related to water quality would be number six and number 14. 
And of course, with the other sustainable goals, you might have some links within the sub uh, goals in, in those um, SDGs. And then, of course, we spoke about eutrophication, the processes involved, where the major source of like what ignites or what starts the uh, eutrophication is always the addition of nutrients, in most cases, nitrates and phosphates. These are coming from yeah, anthropogenic activities, so sewage uh, being released into the water system, like water bodies, and then, of course, leaching of nitrates in, in the soils from fertilizers, and then also burning, <coughs> burning of fossil fuels that contributes to atmospheric uh, component of like uh, nutrients that end up in the ocean. And then you have growth of plants, death of plants, growth of bacteria, and then bacteria is uh, going through respiration, and then you have lack of oxygen and, then, and a dead water body or suffocation. Um, here was just like a link showing you how, you know, like what happens on land and in rivers ends up happening also in the ocean because of the input of excess nitrogen and phosphorus. And if you were walking outside today, it was raining and you can notice like because of the hard surfaces or hard um, in, in, in most of Kampala, the hard surfaces, they contribute to the amount of water that is just being run off. And if you have farming land around or uh, there is uh, accumulation of nutrients, in the end, of course, it all ends up in the ocean that might contribute to some of the eutrophication you see in the waters of Uganda. Um, so, controlling eutrophication, which was one question that was asked yesterday. You can always plant vegetation along stream beds that also reduces um, erosion and also absorbs the nutrients that are in excess in the, in the soil. From, um, from farming and fertilizers. And of course, you can also try to control the application and amount, you know, like the amount of fertilizers used by farmers and when they can start putting fertilizers. And of course, you can also control runoff from feedlots. Um, that is the contribution of um, cows and other animals that contribute to the nitrates and phosphates uh, composition in the environment. And other approaches might be biological. You can also use, uh, uh, introduce bacteria that uh, converts nitrates to harmless molecular nitrogen. Or you simply try to reduce the area that is contributing to runoff, like hard surfaces, either by growing grass or, yeah, as well, in, uh, introducing vegetation that helps improve, like, uh, drainage of water into the soil. And one other way which is more effective, also, yeah, I would consider this to be more effective, uh, penalizing the industries that are involved in, in introducing nutrients in their water bodies and water, uh, water systems. Um, so for today's agenda, which is what I said, we are going to look at plastics. And I hope by the end of the uh, this class or lecture uh, would have an idea why, well, I think everyone knows why plastics are a problem, but I'll try to provide some statistics related to that and some information, extra information to what you already know about plastics. And of course, the challenges in monitoring the plastics in the water system and remote sensing of plastic litter. So here, um, here on the left, you see an impression of like smaller plastic, smaller size plastics that ended up on the on a beach in Hawaii. So obviously, you know it affects tourism as well. If you let's say you had a hotel or resort area uh, located in this area, then of course your residents would not be happy to have this site of plastic accumulating on the beach. And here is another example uh, in Cambodia where you have floating packaging waste. So you notice like here, uh, here on the corner, you, yeah, it's not visible, but it's a small restaurant. And obviously one contributor to the, uh, all the plastic litter you're seeing here is likely the uh, restaurant here where 
the packaging, whenever it's no longer useful, they just throw it into the water. So you can understand how, the, at the end of the day, the question is always, what is the water quality here? Definitely, one would say it's very bad water quality. If we have to measure the different parameters we've been talking about over the last few days, if you are going to measure like the different chemical composition in, in this water, then likely you will, not, you will be shocked. But yeah, of course, um, that's one thing you have to measure. Um, so here in, my, in most of my examples, I'll, we'll be presenting uh, information that is from Europe, as that is information I've found readily available, but of course, uh, would need to find more information related to Africa or Uganda as well. But um, the thing is, at the end of the day, plastics are part of our daily lives and are found almost everywhere. If you look closely here, um, there is high demand for plastic. Well, because one thing, it's cheaper to produce and it's easier to modify into any type of uh, element you want. So you have about 39%, 39.6% of the plastics are used in packaging. So packaging of different things, water, uh, of course here I'm already drinking water from a plastic bottle. You also find use of plastics in buildings and construction. You will also find it uh, in cars, different parts of your car contain plastics. The seats might be made out of like plastic material. You have the dashboard is most likely made out of plastic material. And then of course, one of, although it's like 6.2%, but one of the biggest consumer of plastic material is electrical and electronics like laptops, phones, uh, TVs. Uh, fridges and of course you have also household and uh, leisure and sports material shoes um, then of course also in agriculture the packaging of different materials uh, also requires plastics and then you have other uh, industries that also require plastic and if you try to look at the polymer types and usage you also see the largest portion is on polypropylene and you if you look at different materials some of them at the bottom or on the sides they always indicate the type of polymer and polypropylene is used in food packaging sweet and snake wrappers caps microwave containers pipes automotive parts and strangely enough or well i don't know if it's strange but in banknotes some banknotes actually contain plastic material right and you also have polyethylene like low density or low low density which is used in reusable bags trays and containers agricultural film and food food packaging film right and the high density version or medium density you would have like toys milk bottles shampoo bottles pipes and housewares and once you go to PVC, that's when you start to have like uh, plumbing, um, plumbing materials, and then window frames in some in some countries, and PET, which is like the water bottles and um, containers for cleaning materials as well. Um, then you have thermoplastics that are used in other activity, like uh, for other purposes, um, from touch screens on phones cable coating in telecommunications. So you see the different, the distribution of the different polymers and the different uh, usages they have in, 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 in our daily lives. Um, so just to give you also an understanding, these are statistics from 2019, uh, from 2018 to 2019. So in the world, the production of plastics has actually increased. So from 2018 to 2019, there was an increase from 359 million tons of plastics. So you can understand, like, well, I, I don't know how we can quantify this in terms of like visual, but from 359 to 368 million tons have been produced in the world. But in Europe, uh, 2018, they produced like 61.8 million tons. And they have seen a reduction in the production that is decreased to about 57.9. So efforts are being made to reduce pr plastic usage and plastic production in Europe. And of course, the idea is across the globe in different countries to 
uh, to, in, to reduce production and usage of plastics. Um, the production, as you, can note, as you can see here in the map, the highest production is in Asia, with China producing about 31% of it. So you can imagine, like, well, most of the products, if you look at most of the products, they are made in China. So that, that is no uh, doubt here. And then you have also the Americas, where it's 19%, and Latin America, the southern, like Latin America, it's about 4%. And Africa contributes to about 7% of the uh, plastic production in the world. Uh, next slide, let's see. Uh -huh. Okay, so with the production of plastics, we are talking about 368 million tons of plastics being produced. Of course, it's a good industry, it seems. You can see the numbers. But then, of course, it's also expensive because you have to manage the waste, right? Like, the waste has to go somewhere. And According to United, uh, United Nations Environmental Program, they, well, this is from 2014, they believe like uh, there's a natural capital cost of, of plastic in the consumer goods sector per year, which is about 75 billion US dollars. And a recent estimate suggests that, you know, like the total loss related to plastics to the, to humans or to yeah, people on Earth is estimated to be around 2.2 trillion US dollars, with 1.5 uh, uh, 15,000 billion or 1.5 trillion dollars being lost to ocean damage. So that means any blue economic activity is in trouble. And then you also have um, the production of greenhouse gases, that is from incineration of plastics that would cost us around 695 billion US dollars. And of course, now you have land pollutants, water usage and land disharmony and air pollution, right? Um, so part of the waste, in most cases, they are, I, I like the term that says, you know, like what, what happens to plastics? Either you bury them or you burn them or you befoul them or you recycle them. So the circular economy is, you know, like after you, you, you get the plastic waste, you put it back into the system by either recycling the plastics, right? Or you downcycle the plastics. Um, so here, just to give you an idea, you know, like well, everyone I think have seen a landfill, they have, they have an impression of how a landfill looks like. So from the figures that, you know, like production here, I think th this is like an old, like a previous um, uh, figure. So 330 million tons of plastics are produced. Um, then from the 330, you end up with 260 that is going to waste. So some of the material, you know, like cars, you keep a car for maybe 10, 20 years. So uh, that stays in the system. And uh, what happened? Uh, and then, of course, the waste is, the, most of the plastic is waste, which is 260 million tons. But 200, uh, 40 million tons is going into like circular economy or like it's recycled, either downcycled or recycled. But then the rest is going to be burnt or buried or befouled. So in most cases, you know, like the, the, the burying is done on, land, on landfills, everything is just put together and then covered by uh, soil and in most cases the average like the estimate here is about 105 million tons is being uh, buried in landfills and then like about 65 million tons is just burnt either in open air or incinerators you know like either good managed uh, burning or mismanaged burning where you know like even in different communities people just gather trash put the plastics together they burn it and of course you have the chemicals going into the ground or you have the gases going into the atmosphere, right? And from that you have, some of it is just dumped, you know, like it's just thrown away anywhere, about 35 million tons and six. So like, well, these are just numbers, they give you an impression because of course the statistics always depend on available information, right? So this just tells you like the main challenge is recycled or generating energy or buried in landfills. Um, so, in Europe, uh, I give an example of Europe because I have the statistics. It is believed like about 42%, 42.6% of the uh, plastics, they are just 
are burnt and they are used to generate energy. So you, some form of like, re yeah, some form of recovery of the energy in terms of like burning the plastics to generate energy. So recovering some of the inputs. Then of course you have about 32.5% is recycled. And then the rest is just put on landfills, which is about 24%. So from the numbers collected plastics, about 29.1 million tons. Um, so this is like, well, an impression of what is, uh, how the plastic waste is, is managed in Europe. Um, then of course, plastic waste extra in the EU exports, it has decreased over the years from 2016, 2016 to 2018. So efforts are being made to try to mitigate, you know, plastic waste. And you remember I was just talking about plastic waste being uh, the burning or incineration of plastics. Here is one of the challenges. So considering 42.6% of the plastic is being burned, of course, there is likely going to be a challenge with the gases generated from the burning of the plastics. So what impact does that have? It has impact on human health or even animal health. Then of course the crops, the plants, timber, corrosion, which is if you end up having acidic rain, then of course there's corrosion. If you end up also having acidic rain, you have water acidification. And of course, all these things cost money, right? So there is a cost attached to the burning of plastics, of course. This is, we're trying to deal with the waste, but then of course there's also an extra val uh, added value of doing such activities. So what, what does that mean? You remember we were talking about water quality, that affects your water quality if you have acidic rain or some of these chemicals combined with water and then you have different uh, combinations of chemicals that are toxic to the environment, toxic to like the aquatic environment. And then it means if you are also depending on fish farming or you, are, you depend on fishing, then it means your fish or your products are no longer viable and that is also going to reduce your cost, yeah, uh, your health as well and uh, income. So um, just here to give you an overview, well, this example is of microplastics. So microplastics are generally like, I'll try to give you the operational uh, definition, but here just an example of microplastics, the smaller sized particles. Um, what happens is in most cases, the microplastics in, in some cases, they escape from the uh, waste uh, systems and then they end up in rivers. You remember we we're talking about even the drainage or they are in the environment, runoff brings them to the ocean, right? And or, or in some cases, they just break down from the bigger pieces on the beach or some materials just thrown away on the beach, right? So degradation, you have the bigger plastics, they end up being the smaller. Uh, someone is talking. Yeah. Um, so what happens with the smaller plastics? They are due to the surface currents and winds. They are pushed into the open ocean. When they end up in the open ocean, they accumulate and they either end up in spe some species or like fish, they eat them. And some of them along the way, they, are, they have toxics um, attached to them and they become very toxic to the environment, but then they are consumed by different, uh, uh, different like organisms in the environment. And that means there is a passage of like the toxic material from the smaller microorganism to the larger organisms or mammals in the ocean. And in some cases, in most cases, they end up in the oceanic gyres where they accumulate, or they are either collected by fishing nets or we are, of course, clean up activities. Uh, you remember we, we, I showed some pictures of um, the microplastic uh, trolling we, we conducted in Lake Victoria. Um, and some of them, of course, they are suspended once they, are, they have biofouling, um, like accumulation of bi bi biological material. And then in the end, they get heavier and they sink down in the ocean and, of course, if the biological matter, there is like some mixing in the water column, they are reflow, like brought up or brought down. So there's 
circular motion in the, in, the, in the water column. And if they end up at the ocean basin, you look here, ocean flow, the microplastics might be buried, or in some cases, if there's bacteria that can also eat the micro, the uh, micro, micro organisms on the surface, they might end up being refloated up uh, to the surface, and then they go. The cycle goes on again. So either they end up in within the food chain, or they are buried, or they are just floating at the surface. Right? Any questions about this figure, or this is quite clear for everyone? Please type your questions if you have a question about this figure or you understand it clearly. So, um, you remember I was just talking about the smaller plastics being confused for food. So here I will just, and of course, there's, if the bigger plastics, they might end up uh, being entangled with uh, different mammals. Right, so one of the biggest risks of plastics is they end up accumulating toxic materials. And in this figure, here is like a, a more simplified way you can try to understand this. Like the smaller, you see like the smaller plastics, this, you have different mammals, seabeds, or like even microorganisms in the ocean, they might confuse them for food. And then that means in the food chain, the bigger, the, the, the smaller, the, the smaller organisms will feed on them and then you have the predators, they will feed on them and then it just continues in the food chain until it reaches, for example, whales or like seals. So it's, it's a process that might, you know, like that will end up, you, you will end up having bioaccumulation of toxic material that will, in some cases you have like fish, which yeah, I think some pe most people like to enjoy a nice fish, a nice fish, and you know, like it will end up in the stomachs of fish. And in some studies, they've been showing that you know, like so many fish are in, in some areas they are accumulating plastic material. You know, so here, I, just to give you an impression, these are some of the challenges we have noticed. Like you have seals that end up being entangled in nets. So these are fish nets and nautical ropes. And this is one of the challenges whereby they end up entangled and they, yeah, over time, they just end up dying because no one is available to help, to help them. And then of course here, I think this is one of my nicest pictures where, you know, it just tries to show you how easy it is for the plastics to, end, uh, to affect the environment. And here's a bird uh, trying to play around with the baby um, suckle, right. Um, so, um, one thing before I explain this figure, please note, like, well, no one has actually lived 600 years. So these numbers are just used as an impression or they are just predictions that, you know, like these material are expected to have a lifetime of about 600 years or 50 years or 450 years. So, again, remember, these are just numbers to give you an impression of how long these materials can survive in the environment. But if you look at it, it is expected, you know, like disposable diapers, which I think almost everyone now uses. If you have a baby, you are going to likely use disposable diapers, but not that, you know, like they will survive in the environment for an estimated 450 years. A plastic bottle, same thing. It's estimated it will survive for 450 years. So same thing, uh, plastic beverage holders, um, buoys, cigarette butts, well, they have a sh relatively short lifetime. Um, plastic bags, 10 to 20 years. So like the idea in, in, in this figure is just to show you plastic material has a long lifetime and we have to be very careful when we are using it and we have to find alternatives and you see here a styrofoam cup is about 50 years so I'll just give you a minute to just have a look at all the different materials in here but the take-home message is plastic material has a long lifetime and yeah it's a very big problem for the oceans because most of the material that we dump on land ends up in the ocean so if we consider the ocean like, well, the ocean is about 70% of the Earth's uh, cover, um, surface area. So 
Now think about it, like all this material just ends up in the ocean, then of course, yeah, we are in trouble. Okay, any questions about this or there's a question? I oh, no. thought it was a question. Okay, so plastics have a long life life lifetime. Uh, next slide. And well, so now we are looking at monitoring plastics in the ocean or monitoring aquatic plastics, right? So I put the term aquatic because we find plastics in the open ocean, the marine environment. We find them in rivers, the freshwater system. We find them in lakes. We find them, there have been studies that have been showing like plastics uh, at the bottom of the ocean in Arctic, in the Antarctica as well. Some plastics have also been found in ice. So we find them in almost any aquatic environment. So aquatic covers everything that is related to water. So here, here is just a recent re report just showing you studies have go back all the way to the 1970s. Of course, you, there were very few studies reported. Of course, I, I'm sure like uh, the finding of plastic in the water has been happening for years, but the reported or published, uh, re uh, published works go back to the 1970s. And you see from 2000, that's when you start to have like a very rapid increase in the number of studies looking at plastic. So same here, there is a comparison from 1980 to 2013. You see just from the, well, from 1990s year as well, there's a rapid increase in the number of studies, right? Again, going back to history, I always try to give some background on history. One of the yeah, classic papers they discovered plastics in 1974. They were doing, again, oceanography, ocean field studies, doing measurements, different instrumentation. And here they collected small plastic noodles. As you can see here, the different types of plastics they found. So you see the different types of materials they were finding at that time. So all you can imagine like, well, obviously plastic was put in landfills and then of course with runoff it ends up in the ocean or maybe people were out at sea, they just throw away their trash out at sea. And then in, the, in 1972, there was a study also in Sargasso Sea surface. They found these different types of plastics in white pellets, mostly white colored white colored pellet, excuse me. And then the, over the years, there have been like continued studies and here you see there's 11 year data set. So you remember we were talking about why we need to take measurements for hind casting and then we can also do predictions based on hind casting data. So here they have collected data for 11 years. Every year they, they go at least once or twice with the ship in the same area or in the same region and then they, they start to have a time series. So the importance of understanding water quality is you need to have a time series. You take measurements over time, same areas, and taking different parameters to understand what is happening. So with the 11 year data set, they can have an understanding of probably where the plastics are coming from. If you have a grid where you, you, you start maybe from land or like different parts of the ocean, so you can have an understanding where they're coming from, where they're accumulating, the types of plastic, the amount of plastic, and also the sizes and the different colors. So all these parameters, if you measure, you know, like you need qualitative and quantitative data. Any questions about this? No questions? Everyone understood? Wonderful. Okay. So again, I always have to bring up this. Uh, this is a nice like schematic I always try to show. So the one thing with pl uh, monitoring aquatic plastics, right? So plastic litter distribution data has been gathered through over the years. It's been through like net trolls, you know, like for the example I gave um, with the field study we did here on Lake Victoria, you have a net, you uh, collect uh, material that accumulates in the net. 
over a time period, and then you can calculate the distance covered, and then you have an area coverage, and you put the numbers like, well, we found, let's say, 100 pieces of plastic within an area, let's say, well, five square meters, five square kilometers, because you know the speed at which your boat is moving, you know your starting coordinate, you know the end coordinate, so you can calculate the distance and area covered, right? So with that data here, you have data to do now casting, and then if you collect it over a long time, you can do height casting. You see the 11 year data set. So if we, we, we get more funds, we'll do the same thing next year or maybe in a few months, we do it again, we do it again, then we end a time series. So we can do now casting, getting data from that day. And then of course, getting data from the previous years. And then we put that data into numerical models and then apply theory from what we understand how the ocean behaves, cut and uh, wind speed and all that information. Then we have like a very, well, an excellent or scientific understanding of what is actually happening. Then we can do like forecasting what will likely happen. So based on numerical models, you can see here, here's an example, like a, a numerical model computation that suggests that, you know, like in the ocean, we have like five major zones where plastics are likely to be accumulating. And it, over the years, this area has been studied very much and it has been noted to have like a, a, a very high concentration of plastic material from different sizes, you know, smaller size, bigger size plastics. And then of course, there are other regions in the Atlantic Ocean, Southern Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Pacific Ocean, and then you also have some uh, expected region of accumulation in the Indian Ocean, right? So models have been used to locate hotspots and understand some of the dynamics. So you, with numerical models, where you have some, you combine theory and data, so the importance of data, as you remember, we talked about, we have to collect the data, and you put that in with theory, you get numerical solutions, understanding predictions, right? Um, one thing, uh, just to yeah, for some some might know, some might not know. So from today, you will know. <laughs> um, size classes. When you hear someone talking about plastics, um, there are different definitions of plastics. There are microplastics. The microplastics are the plastic materials or the the objects that have a diameter of less than five millimeter, but it's greater than 330 microns. Why 330? Because of, a tech, it's a technical uh, definition. Why? Because most of the nets that are used are generally 330 microns. So it means any material that is retained from 330 and has a diameter of, well, of course, when you have a net, which has a mesh size of 330, unless it's clogged, most of the material that is less than this size will be left will be left in the water column, like it will just go through the net, right? But well, of course, if its material is accumulating, then of course you will end up having smaller size material accumulating as well. But generally, you will have microplastics. Something is less than five millimeter diameter up to 330, due to the mesh size of the net, right? And by definition, if you really are interested in this, you look, there's a nice report, which is a group of experts. They consider nanoplastics anything less than one micrometer, right? Then the microplastics, they are in the millimeter size range. And then here's the impression of the different size. You have megaplastics, mesoplastics, right? So macroplastic, when you hear people talking about macroplastics, in most cases is anything that has a diameter greater than five millimeters. Any questions about the size definitions here? No questions, everyone understood? Microplastics, macroplastic. Okay, wonderful. Um, so the Issue we have been talking about like monitoring plastics, we are using nets. Here you use the nets, or you use where people, if you have the bigger plastics, if you're on a ship, you can 
count the bigger plastics, maybe the smaller plastics, but yeah, in most cases you count the bigger pieces that are easier to count. And we want to know because like, well, we, we know like plastics are ending up in, in landfills, but then they are also ending up in the ocean through dumping or landfills. You have erosion and then material is brought up to the surface. When you have heavy rains, material just is transported to the waterways and ends up in the ocean, right? So we combine the, we do like regression analysis and then combine that information into uh, models. But then one challenge has been data is just not enough. What they did, some experts in Maximenko, Le Breton, and Van Sebil, they came up with three different models and they compared their models. And what they discovered is, especially in the equatorial region and also in the polar regions, due to lack of data, they have differences that are in the factor, of, like a factor of 100. That's how they vary. Look at the different plots here. So, for example, in the North Pacific, one model is estimating like amounts of plastics uh, in to, um, like 15, here it's 10, and then this one is assuming like somewhere around seven, eight, right? And then if you look at the Mediterranean, like in the equatorial region, like close to the equatorial region, you see there how large the differences are. Here it's about 30, and this is like 15, half the, um, the estimate from this model. And then this is like, well, what? Almost one third of this model predictions, 10 times uh, differences here. So the issue of lack of data also contributes to the differences in the models, like what they are estimating. So numerical models for the plastics across the global oceans depend on very little data. Different locations. These are spots like, you know, like some data might be available from Lake Victoria, maybe just one or two data points. And then from um, Great Lakes, you might have one or two points. So obviously, if you do modeling, you have very large uncertainties or errors. Um, so when you are going to do monitoring of plastics, you have to account for these factors. You know, like the abundance, the amount of bigger plastics in the environment is really relatively smaller compared to the microplastics, if you really have to do the numbers to count them. And then mass, of course, the, it increases. If, yeah, if you combine the smaller pieces and the bigger pieces, the mass will increase as you go to the bigger pieces. But if you look at the environmental risk as the bigger pieces, you really do not have, well, you have to worry it's plastic, but you don't have to worry about like the bigger pieces being ingested by different yeah species in the environment, like well, I say wells or maybe fish, but then if you go to the smaller pieces, the microplast. If you go to the micro, most of the mammals or like uh, my organisms in the ocean, they will likely confuse them as food, right? And then with entanglement, the smaller pieces, the chances are very low of like smaller pieces entangled on cells um, or other. So, for you to understand the entanglement, here's the picture I showed earlier on. Let's see if I can. Yeah, here with the so this is like the scenario where we are talking about entanglement. So the bigger pieces are like the bigger uh, objects of plastics are likely to be entangled on um, yeah different mammals and uh, animals. And so when we are saying is of sampling, how easy to sample? Well, of course. It's all difficult to know the technology requires so much effort. But if you have to look or sample for the bigger pieces, that's quite easy. As you can see here, they're quite easy to score. You can easily see them with, with, with your eyes. You don't really need to worry about like looking for like looking for them. But the smaller pieces, of course, you need a net, and then it takes so much effort in terms of like putting the net out at sea and then collecting the samples. So also in terms of information, as you click on the plastics, you lose information. You cannot see what polymer it is. If you look at your water bottle, it's likely at the bottom, there should be a label PET or 
in most cases it's PET, but then once it breaks down into the smaller pieces, then it's quite difficult to understand where, what polymer it is, right? So the pieces that are easy to identify them also have like the day of production, which is quite easy to identify as well. Um, how easy is it? Well, again, the smaller pieces are quite difficult, but the bigger pieces you can start to, um, uh, how do you say? Uh, this factors, is it there? No questions? Okay. Um, so, some and four notes in most cases. And that means, you know, like that 30 minutes, you are really, yeah, you know, just, you know, but we have seen that over the years, that's not enough. So the open question, and boy, for you provided the answer. Remote sending is one. You have to do remote sensing. Well, over the years, we have had some very smart. like or unique uh, spectral features, spectral features that you can easily identify plastics and separate them from other things in the environment that have an optical signature. Remember, we were talking about remote sensing of the ocean, because in the ocean we have parameters that, that have an optical signature. You remember the sea dome, the chlorophyll, the water itself, and also the solid uh, Like what I just said, plastics have a natural signal that is unique. Of course, in the visible, anything that has color, it's always challenging to discriminate it from other items. So, of course, when you look at a green umbrella and you're going to look at something else that is green, you're going to have features that represent green color because it's in the visible range, right? I'll try to explain that in the uh, upcoming slides. But then the, the, the features are within the range uh, in the infrared from 750 to 1,500 nanometers. So they are instruments that actually measure uh, light or the signal received from uh, the ocean outside the visible range, you know, like where the human eye can just Distinguish color. And if you really come to think of it, and there are so there are some recycling centers where uh, these light properties are actually what they do is they when they collect waste, they simply put the plastics and then it simply separates everything. Like you separate, you know, like PET material from uh polypropylene material or it might separate things according to color or such things. So these approaches have actually been used. Unfortunately, like in the recycling system, this is industry, so we don't know how they actually do it. Um, the science is there, but then of course it's trade in, it's a trade secret. So for scientists, we have to do it the hard way, trying to understand things from the beginning, how actually we can distinguish the different uh, polymer and different colors of plastics. Any questions about this? People understand? Wonderful. Um, so, um, if you remember the, you know, on the first day I said like, well, my current research is related on the potential use of remote to get additional data about acquiring. So, 
most of my work is based on using remote sensing data that is gathered from ships, drones, aeroplanes, uh, high altitude pseudo satellites, stations in space, or fixed observatories on land uh, looking at you know like waterways or um, beach areas. And one of the objectives of using remote sensing that has been uh, raised by the community as far like, well, of course, most people who are interested in, in remote sensing of plastic litter, what are they hoping to get out of it? Either just, they just want to know if they are plastics. So for some people, if they are going to do cleanup, they just want to know if they are plastics and then they take a sheep or they direct, you know, like volunteers or like their employees to say, go to this area, go clean up, right? Or some people are interested in identifying the plastics, like they want to know what kind of plastic is there. And of course, in, more, in most cases, people want to know how much is there. So detecting is mostly qualitative. You just want to know yes or no. Are there plastics? Yes. Are there no plastics? No, right? And identification, that means, you know, like you have to do some quantification and trying to know like, well, what, well, what type of plastic is it and how many of them of PET or like LDPE is there. Quantification, well, quantitative analysis. And then of course, with the tracking, there's also some quantitative analysis where you have to know your reference, where you're starting, where it's going, the speed it is traveling at. So with the detection, here's an example of how most detection is done is just you look at the different bottle, like you take an image from a drone or maybe a plane or from a satellite, then you just say, well, they are plastics. How do you describe them? You use, in most cases, qualitative parameters, or yeah, in some cases, some quantitative parameters. You describe the shape, the color, the size, and the form, right? Like, and this information you don't really need sophisticated sensors, you can simply use RGB sensors. Either it's an image that was taken with your phone, an image that was taken with uh, just a digital camera. So this is quite, um, quite simplified. But then when you want information to identify or distinguish the, the plastics, then of course you require information in the short wave infrared or thermal spectrum to determine the polymers. That's where you, you start to, to require sophisticated and uh, sophisticated state-of-the-art instrumentation. Either you do analysis in the lab or you use instrumentation that is handheld or it could be uh, positioned on a camp or on a, on a plane or said but that requires uh, for you to discriminate or to identify the different polymers within the plastics. So for some people, detection is just enough. And for some people, they want to detect and they also want to identify, right? And then you go to other people. Then you also have people who want to quantify. But then at the moment from quantification, the question is always, if you're looking at plastics from the top, you have a top view, you don't know what is below the surface. So for example, if you look at this picture, you might see, you, you can say, well, we have roughly this amount of plastic per area. You can quantify it like just take a picture. Say, well, the whole one square kilometer is covered with plastics, but then you don't know what's below. So say that's one of the challenges we have for remote sensing that you can only see what's on top, but you don't see what's below. So if it's going to be like, I don't know, one, one meter or two meters of plastics buried below here, you cannot really tell unless you do like in situ survey. So that's one challenge. So with quantification, you can do actual counts. That means, you know, the extra work on actually counting every piece, or you just do pixel coverage to say we have 20 pixels that are one, one by one square kilometer, uh, one by one kilometer size and then you have all these pixels covered so you say like for an area of two square kilometers with 100 coverage of plastics or you do area coverage same yeah it just depends the units you want to use so you can either say fibers per, per cubic meter of water if you do lab analysis or plastic pieces per square kilometer 
And then, of course, over time, you want to track the plastics because if they are coming from land, once they are in the water, they will move with the currents and wind, wind direction. Depending on wind direction and currents, you will likely have them moving. There is a question. Is it possible to monitor plastics located at a greater depth via remote sensing? That is a great question from Francis. Um, the, from remote sensing, yeah, the challenge, as I have just explained, you only see what's on the surface, right? But if you're going to be on a ship, then you can always have the nets. You have the nets collecting uh, material in, let's see if I can show this again, in this format, you know, like at the surface, or you can have them being deployed in a downward direction. Does that make sense? So you have to go to depth and then you collect your samples going up like you pull your net. That is one of the easiest way. Or you can have, well, an, an ROV or like or, uh, AUV in, in, in the water column that will collect imagery for you. Then you can have an idea of where the plastics are and try to quantify the plastics in the water column. So it's possible, but from remote sensing, like using satellite, you see, so using the different platforms I show here, like drones, aircrafts, um, high out, you only see what's on the surface, right? Same thing when you're doing trolling, net trolling, you probably get material, which is depending on the opening of the net, maybe 50 centimeters from the surface, right? But the types of nets where you can actually do different water depth, of course, you'd have to lower the, the nets in different depth. Is that all? I hope it's clear, Francis. Is there anyone else who might have? Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. I'm happy people answered the question clearly. Yeah. Um, so Detect, AI, detect, identify, quantify, and track. These are the main objectives of using remote things. So obviously, once it's all, once things are well established, then of course you operational where we continuously can detect and identify, quantify, and track to understand where the plastics are going. So the main motive behind tracking, the you can imagine the main motive behind tracking is trying to identify the sources and the sinks of the plastics, right? If you have a satellite that can cover the earth every day, you can always have an idea on a daily basis where the most plastics are located or they are coming from. And if you want to do cleanup or if you want to impose fines to certain regions of the world, or maybe let's say if you're looking at Lake Victoria, you can have an image that will explain maybe people and Jinga are the ones releasing more plastics into Lake Victoria. So you can either have the authorities trying to come up with policies or ways to mitigate that, right? So that advantage of tracking. Next slide. So uh, as we are also exploring, you know, like remote sensing of plastics in, in uh, using, uh, using different platforms, there's always the question of size. One might be wondering, are you going to be able to see a single microplastic in the millimeter size range? Well, the answer at the moment is no. So the correct terminology we are trying to use in the community is aggregated plus. What does it mean aggregated? So it's, you will see when you are looking at remote sensing, most of the sensors, you have a pixel coverage, say, well, with world view, you can get up to 30 centimeters by 20 centimeters. So that means it may be at sub pixel, you might see something within the centimeter range, but that's very unlikely. What we are saying is with remote sensing, you see patches like this. What size? This is something that is being studied, right? What, what's the limit? Yeah, I cannot really give you a number, but we are looking at patches. We are trying to understand with the different satellite missions that are already in space and probably like the new ones upcoming, what would be the nice, the good requirements for looking at plastics. And here the microplastics is here. 
trying to observe them maybe in a lab. Of course, you see it from airborne sensors, you might have a limited or some pieces that are in the meter size. And then of course, here the aggregated metric. And the different sensors that will provide information would be ranging from optical spectral techniques, laser-based techniques. These are all being investigated actually at the moment. And here you have high spatial resolution imaging, microwave, radar, and LIDAR in instrumentation. So I hope any questions here? So size, size actually matters, you know, like at the moment, due to the size continuum and diversity, we are looking at aggregate, you know, like the material that is aggregate. So looking at small, here the bigger piece, the pieces are like, in most cases, one meter, four meters, four meters. So with some, with most sensors, you'll be able to identify if they have high resolution, high geospatial resolution sensing capability. Any questions about this? Okay. So remember the factors I was talking about, the abundance, the mass, ease of sampling, the environmental risk. So now I've added ease of remote sensing. So if you look at it at the moment, we are looking at it's quite easy or like well studies you know, proof of concept studies have been showing like the bigger pieces of plastics in the five meter, five meters, 10 meters. If you have large patches of plastics, you can identify them from most of the sensors. Like, well, if they have, of course, high geospatial resolution and the spectral resolution required to identify plastics. And one of like, one example I would also want to include is the focus of remote sensing, trying to see if we actually can do remote sensing, has been on shorelines, you know, like at beach, beach areas where you have large accumulations of plastics. And then you have European Space Agency. Um, there are different initiatives that they are uh, working on towards plastics as well. And let's see, I can go. Okay, so. There is, in 2020, a group of scientists came together, experts, and also from different space agencies. They came together and then they decided to form a task force. So what, what is in the task force? You have space agency representatives from European Space Agency, the Indian Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, and NASA, where you also have experts from industry and academia, like scientists, like myself. So in the, in the team, they are trying, it's called the IOCCG Task Force on Remote Sensing of Marine Litter and Debris. The goal of this team is to come up with proposals or ideas or ways whereby scientists would propose like how we can come up, how the available technologies or what should be available in the future sensors that could be relevant to monitoring of remote sensing. The team will try to uh, combine efforts with the other experts, uh, not necessarily in the team, but from the community that are looking at different sensors and try to understand like the capability of the different sensors on remote sensing of litter. Um, One second, I'll respond to the question by, by Professor Girudo here. Um, so technologies, algorithms, and applications. So using the current data sets that are available, we will try to, the team will also try to see if the algorithms are uh, good enough or they can be improved. Same, what data sets are needed, how we can improve on data sets, and then interdisciplinary aspects where you try to identify if how we remote sensing can support policy makers, be it education or different entities that are interested in, in uh, looking at plastic. So the question here is, are there any African initiatives contributing towards the monitoring of aquatic plastics? As far as I know, in terms of monitoring, I, there is a team in South Africa, they have been coming up with different reports and proposals on how to do monitoring in lakes or even on land. So the, yeah, the answer is yes, but yeah, the extent of their activities 
from my perspective, is still growing. And there's still some potential. And of course, I, I guess well, the, the answer is we can also start one in Uganda at Makarere. So it's, it would be nice to have one here. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. And yeah. Um, if you are interested in understanding more about this initiative or the IOCCG task force, here's the link. I'll give you maybe a few seconds to write it down if you are interested. Or you can just Google it on, uh, here's the title, just Google the title in terms of reference. Okay. And yeah, so th the team is made up of, uh, as I ex explained earlier, space agency uh, representatives. So there's Paolo Corradi from European Space Agency, from NASA, you have Laura Roenzoni, you have Dubashish Mitra from the Indian Space Agency. And from the Japanese, you have Hiroshi Murakami. And I am like the scientific chair for, for, the, uh, for the task force. And the main goal of the task force is to coordinate. So we are not really doing the science. We just coordinate the advancements of current and future remote sensing technologies and approaches, techniques that have the potential to provide like observation or data about plastic litter overall um, aquatic environment, so in rivers, lakes, oceans, seas, name it, as long as it is a, a water body. And then, of course, with the different topics, the, uh, the one dealing with um, algorithms and uh, applications, Manuel Arias and Lorraine Biermann, looking at interdisciplinary activities, and one of the founding members, uh, Francois Regis, Martin Lezer, and then Victor Martinez Vincente is looking at technologies, the different tools we can use to look at uh, plastics, investigate plastic. And some milestones of the task force, it was only, well, it had a kickoff meeting in 2021 in February. And a website is available. Here's the link at the top. So it's just iocg.org group marine-liter-debris. And if you go on the website, it's a nice website, and we would like to thank, like, Venetia, the um, coordinator at the Iowa CCG, for creating a very nice website. And it's, I, I always try to call it a one-stop shop. So the idea of this website is for anyone who is interested in starting or trying to figure out what is being, what is being done or what has been done or what is planned in terms of remote sensing of marine litter, here is your source, like data, where if you are interested in looking at data, if you are interested in activities that are going to happen, if you are interested in publications, everything is on the website. So I recommend this website, I strongly recommend this website. If you are interested in remote sensing of marine litter, you can be doing your bachelor, you can be doing other studies, but I think the material there we have provided is useful to everyone. And in April, we had a bi-monthly meeting where you know, the committee members were discussing ways to move forward. And in July, we had a first workshop of the team's um, uh, team members. So again, like I was just saying, it's a one-stop shop. As of October, we have accumulated about 60 different papers that are from different scientists in the community, but these so the, the, the bibliography we have is, if you are interested in remote sensing of marine litter, this is your first source of information. Like if you are going to try to start doing remote sensing of marine litter, I highly recommend you have a look at this website. You will find most of the interesting papers there. Of course, if there is a paper that is missing, we also suggest that people just send an email. There's a, um, there's a way how to uh, have your paper included or highlighted on the website. And we have also started um, a bibliography of data sets. So people, when you collect your data, you make it open access, then here we have a link. So if you're going to also look for data, this would be your source. You just go on the website, you look for the data, it's available and it's open access. Of course, we hope like, if you're going to do your science as well, you make your data open access. Um, again, so I, over the years I've been seeing that most people have to do science in open access or 
open, op, uh, open source. If you're going to develop software, it's nice to make it open source. If you're going to collect data, process it, make it open access. So here's a nice paper as well to understand the FAIR policy. And we have also made, um, made a list of different repositories. So like these are websites or sources where you can store your data. Once you store your data there, the idea is it's open access. Anyone can access it from anywhere in the world. And it's for free, right? And they, with the different, you, you are not, um, well, mandated to be putting data to any website, but we highly recommend you put your data in open access once you are, well, in most cases, people prefer to make their data open access when they publish. So that's fine when you publish, please consider putting your data here in one of these websites. Well, this is not, the, the list is not endless, but of course, there are more and more other websites. This is just a short list we try to compile. Um, so the link to the website as well, it's under IOCCG, RSMLD, dash online, dash repositories, right? Um, as I mentioned, we also have different activities, so upcoming events, related research projects, call for proposals, careers and jobs, newsletters. So already there are about 30 research projects. So the idea now, you see now why I was saying like it's a one-stop shop. If there's a topic you are interested in that is already being done, you can also get information instead of doing things from scratch. You can already start from a, a step ahead where, you know, like people would tell you like, well, use this sensor, use that sensor, do it this way, do it that way. Maybe try to do it in, in a dark room, maybe do it outside in the sunshine. So all that information, the idea of the different projects is you can get information on how you can advance what is not known instead of doing science, assuming you are the first one to do it. And then when you're about to publish, you realize, well, it has already been done and then it's time wasted and effort uh, lost. Um, yeah, so just final, I think that's one of the final slides on this topic. So the core topics, each team works independently on its topic in terms of technologies or algorithms. But then of course, we try to merge things uh, at some point in time during the meetings we have with the committee. And in the coming year, we hope to have draft reports. And these reports may will be updated into different versions, version one, version two, depending on advances in technologies or in, in terms of data set collection or different algorithms as well. So sometimes team members or invited experts might also present during the meeting. So like we have uh, monthly meetings or some teams have bi-monthly meetings. Um, here, just to summarize the community white papers, these are, you know, like, uh, you remember I was talking about having 60 or 80 authors from across the globe, different regions of the world, different expertise. They try to come together to see how their different knowledge can contribute. So here, this was a paper on uh, the physical oceanography of the transport of floating marine debris. And here you have, a group, uh, a number of experts with background in oceanography. You also have experts in, in instrumentation and remote sensing. Same here. You had mostly experts in remote sensing, but some experts as well in the oceanography, how things are actually working in the ocean. And same here, this is trying to come up with a monitoring system of plastics that will include remote sensing, modeling, and the data. So it combines everything with the understanding so that we can do predictions easier and have things in one place. Woohoo! Should I? We continue? Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, as we continue, so um, here are some published works where I have done some contribution. Um, research works with my contribution, like I just highlight some of them here. And yeah, now we're getting more deeper into the remote sensing of plastics. 
Um, I'll start with this, uh, one of my initial publications related to monitoring of plastics. I think, yeah, okay. So the title was an airborne remote sensing case study of synthetic hydrocarbons. So plastics are synthetic hydrocarbons. And here we used shortwave infrared information identified from um, marine harvested, so collected from the ocean. So macro and microplastics, you remember the size definition I gave before, like microplastics is anything below five millimeter diameter. And then anything above that would be macroplastics, right? So you would wonder how I ended up looking at plastics. So when I was at the University of Connecticut, um, under the supervision of Professor Dr. Dearson, we went, well, I don't know how it came up to her, but like we went to an art exhibit, which was a collection of plastic material, like harvested, you know, like plastic that is washed ashore, that end up on shorelines, on beaches. So some people came up with an idea to make artwork out of it. So the idea was to showcase the artwork in also, in so doing again, they were also trying to teach people, you know, like, well, there's so much plastic we are just throwing away. Let's be aware that, you know, like whenever we are using plastic, most of it ends up in the ocean or it ends. That's why you see like most of the, uh, the sculptures or artworks are either it's a seal or it's a fish. So it's just trying to explain that, you know, like most of the plastic ends up in the ocean and it's affecting the mammals or the uh, organisms in the ocean. And here you see another like very big uh, seal again. Uh, and then it, here they just try to provide some understanding what happens when you plastics end up in the ocean. Uh, different animals confuse it for food and then of course it ends up in their stomachs or like they are entangled in the plastics. So that's one of the challenges. So how did we do this study? So we looked at marine harvested microplastics. These were collected using a net uh, from the North Atlantic and also from the Pacific Ocean. And then like the bigger pieces, they were collected, you know, like macroplastics greater than five millimeter. These were collected from the west coast of the USA. So these are the pieces we looked at. And we also looked at uh, virgin pellets. So these are like the, the, the raw material you use to make different types of plastic. So in most cases, if you're going to make a bottle, they, they usually start from these pellets, right? And the measurements, we used an instrument that uh, measuring hyperspectrum. You remember we talked about multispectral and hyperspectral. So this instrument is hyperspectral. In the end, you get information which is interpolated to one nanometer. So you have information from 350 nanometers to 2,500 at one nanometer steps, so 351, 352, 353, right? And then when you are using the instrument, it's a, it's a relatively small instrument. It's like the ghost, if anyone has watched the Ghostbusters, it's the same thing. You have a small bag, that's where you have your instrument, and you have your sensor looking at the sample and then you are measuring light. And here you see I'm holding a white panel. So the white panel is I measure the light which is coming in. So the idea or the concept is this panel is 99% reflective. It reflects light in all directions. Ideally, it reflects light in all directions at 99% right. So if you're going to have it in your hand and the sun is out, so it, it, it's supposed to act as a mirror. You can also measure looking at the light, but you can measure looking at it. Then you measure this, you, you, you say that's your reference, right? So you look at your sample, as I'm doing here in this example, you measure the light properties, and then you divide what you get. So it's the same, the concept is the, similar to uh, albedo, you know, what's coming in, the ratio of what's coming in and what's coming out. So what is being reflected by the target material, which are the plastics, and what is coming in is the same as what's being reflected off this white panel. Any questions about that? Okay, good. Um, so most of these 
uh, other samples, we measured them in a blackened area. And the whole idea of measuring them in a dark area, so this is my panel, my 99. Here we have everything covered in black. The idea is to say that when we are looking at the plastics, we are only getting the light signal coming from the plastics, not from the surrounding. That's the concept, having the black background. Does that make sense? Or anyone has a question why we do it in black here? If it's in the, if it's in the environment, if there are bigger pieces, then of course it's quite easier. You just know like if you're at 10 centimeter distance, everything is, the signal you're getting is largely from your, your target. So for example, if you look at these pieces, if you look at here, this piece, if I'm going to measure very close to the piece, like at one centimeter, then I know the signal is coming from here very little influence would be expected from the other pieces around here. But then if you have smaller pieces like here where you put them together, then you're likely going to have challenges of trying to understand where the signal is coming from, right? Makes sense, I hope so. Um, today we didn't have a quiz, well, the other quiz I already gave you the answers. Can people in the next maybe two minutes type their answers? In the figure here, can you identify the peak and the valley? So you just type one, the peak is A or B, uh, valley is A or B, right? So B here is the, this part and A is this part. Please type your answer, what you consider the peak. So either you write peak, your answer is B or A and valley is a or B or B or A, whatever you think it is. Uh, we have 27 people, so I expect at least 20 answers. That's a good percentage. Yeah. Are we connected or people are listening? So the question is peak, can you, so the question is what is the peak? Uh, one, you identify the peak, is it B or A? When you look at this signal, which one would you assume is the peak or is, yeah. Is that clear for Brian? Is this a valley or a peak? Is this a peak or a valley? That's the question. Okay, more answers, more answers. Just one answer already. I'm waiting for more answers. More answers are coming. Okay, okay. Well, it seems people are slowly answering. More answers, please. Yeah, you can also answer here in the room. <laughs> hmm. Okay, one more minute.
All right. I think we have a good number of answers. Any more answers coming in? Let's see. Okay. Just give you a few seconds. Okay, so I'll continue then. It seems people understand this. Okay, so when we are doing studies of reflectance or spectral signature, we look at several things, right? You would have a peak, which is the point where you have, you know, like the highest point. So in reflectance, you have peak. And when you're describing the, these features here, a valley, what we normally call a valley, that's an absorption feature. Like when you are in reflectance form, this is an absorption feature. So in reflectance, so if something is going to reflect so much signal in the visible spectrum, like from 400 to 800, that's how you match the apparent color. So what your human eye can see is the peak you identify in the visible spectrum. I hope this makes sense, or it's quite simple, or if anyone has a question, please ask. So if you are in the, between 400 and 700 nanometers, if you see a peak, that should be matching the color of that object. But then when you go outside the 700 nanometer, then your human eye cannot really dis distinguish the light in that, uh, the peaks in the light you observe, right? So the absorption feature is your valley, the peak is in the visible, matches your color. And then other descriptive features used when you, you read the paper or you, like you hear me talk about, you would have magnitude or intensity, like how the, or it's in most cases in reflect. Your reflectance is normally, because you, you normalize it to the incoming light albedo, so it's a percentage or it's just a number between zero and one. So you have the peak, you have a value, which is an absorption feature, or the shape or the magnitude. These are parameters you uh, try to define. So when we were looking at the bigger pieces of microplastics, the different colors matched the different plastics, the dark blue and the light blue. You see there's a peak around four, 450. You remember here I was talking about the different colors. So blue is around 450. And well, same in this in this image, you see like the blue plastic, it has a peak in the blue, and then the green plastic has a peak in the, in, the, in the green, and then the red plastic has a peak in the red, right? So that makes sense, I hope. So same thing here with the white, white, white material generally is flat in the, in the visible, right? A very high signal. So you have a very high signal, generally flat uh, shape. So, here I highlight where we find the valleys. You remember I was talking about the valleys. These are the absorption features here. And we identified for all the different plastics, they were the same at 931, 415, 14, 17, and 1732. If you look, I highlighted these different colors. You will see the, there is a valley in all the signals we measured from the different type, like what well, different shapes and different types of plastics here. Of course, there are different, so you see the different shapes and peaks in the visible spectrum, 400 to 700. You see the blue ones, the blue, the green, green and the green peak. But then they absorb light in the same regions, plus they're most likely from the same material or not necessarily the same material, but hydrocarbons. So you have the valleys here for the macropass. Uh, and then you remember we also looked at the raw material. So the idea of measuring the properties of raw materials is you create a library, a reference library. That means whenever you take measurements, you can always compare it because you know the raw material, you can always tell it's, yeah, this is most likely PVC. So this is a similar approach they use to identify, you know, like if you are going to do FTIR, like Fourier transfer uh, infrared, uh, the most commercial companies, you have to buy the library. But then the idea here was to make it open access. Then if you're going to measure, these are the most, uh, well, some of the uh, typical materials. And you remember I was talking about 
are used for everyday activities. So some of the materials are found here. Mostly, if you're going to measure plastics outside, you would have a near match with one of these. And if you really want to do further stuff, of course, you can do analysis using scale or like for your transform or um, round space. So we had 11 different materials. So our is open access. We can access it anywhere in the world. And here we tested the idea of what well, can identify different plastics. So if you match the my plastic and member, so we the different plastics. So you, you see here the smaller plastics, we had grouped them according to size, like 0.68, 2 millimeters. And here and we measured their spectral properties. They are the same, but the only difference was the magnitude. Here, of course, with some differences in the visible, so we don't really care about the visible because, like, visible, you also have issues with the environment. Like, you're going, if you have a green plastic and a green vegetation, you likely have the same shape because they share the same color and they are both hydrocarbon. So, if you're looking at vegetation, it's hydrocarbon. Plastic is also synthetic hydrocarbon, right? But then they have the same values, absorption features at 9, um, 939, around 900, 1200, 1400, 1700. Similar to what we found, again, you remember, in the macroplastics, same features. We found them. The absorption features or the values are located here. We go to, uh, to the macro, to the microplastics, same thing. But here, the only thing that, that is different is magnitude. The shape is the same with some slight difference here in the, in the visible, but generally here, same shape, everything is the same, right? So we calculated an end member. End member means something representative. So we would say this is a signal that is representative of microplastics. And that's the blue line here. And you find that it's closely matched to some of these materials. If you look at where the values are located, of course, there are some shifts to the left or to the right. So here it provides us a, a proof of concept that, you know, like the library site is for people can easily predict unknown materials using the reference to say, well, we have, it's likely PET or polypropylene. Um, here, this is an example of just showing you again, like the microplastic mean reflectance. So this is the representative signal. And then we overlay it over the atmospheric transmittance. So this tells you like how much the atmosphere is uh, transmitting light. So if you're in the blue regions, like wavelength is in the blue, you're okay. You can do measurements without uh, worrying about the contribution of the atmosphere. But if you are here where you have the gaps, you know, like the valleys within this signal, the white parts, that's where you are outside the atmospheric window. So here the window, that means light can be transmitted uh, like to Earth or going outside the Earth system, right? So the atmosphere is our window. You are here, you are in the window, you are outside the window. So if you are outside the window, that means you have to do some atmospheric correction to try to identify the signal coming from, let's say, plastics. So if you're going to look at plastics, ideally, you want to deal with signal in this area, which is the 1215 uh, feature, or 1732, that would be also nice, or anything around 2200 here, that would be also quite uh, feasible, right? Make sense, or any questions about that? Okay. Um, so, knowing that 2.15 and 17.32, the, 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 the features that are not affected by the atmosphere, like if you have a, a signal that is being measured, you really do not really have to worry much about correcting for the contribution of the atmosphere, like the atmospheric gases, like water vapor, oxygen in the atmosphere. So... Uh, there's a question, let's see. So, there, here is our mean spectra of, or mean of the plastics, right? So if you look at the plastics, the same, we look for the mean, the 
because the mean keeps the shape, but of course the magnitude is different. But if you are going to do more algorithms, they don't really care about the magnitude. They use the shape. They they use the shape relationship to identify different features, or use the shape to uh, detection. Uh, so, if you are going to have a satellite in space, or you are going to fly a plane, if you have a signal which is so, if you are going to do any measurements uh, of um, anything that has an optical signature, you'd rather do them in the regions where you have this blue region, like the blue parts, where you have more of uh, atmos the atmosphere allows light to pass through from the surface to space. I hope that answers the question. So, how does that how does that mix uh, how does that how is that useful to us? So, if you are going to make any measurements, you don't require any atmospheric correction. So that means you can make nice measurements of parameters on Earth using these features. So if you are looking at plastics, you can look at these features and then you make an algorithm. If you make an algorithm at 1732, you can easily identify plastics, pl materials bearing plastics. So here is like a landfill in California, USA. Then some of these other areas, these are rooftops. So here you have a rooftop of a bar and a factory just up here. Uh, is it sharing now? It seems my screen. Hmm? No, someone said, please share screen. Sure. Uh, okay, yeah. So. I'll just go back again. So here, I hope everyone understood. So measurements in this in this region is not easy. You'd have to do so much atmospheric correction due to the contribution of um, in absorption and scattering of light by the different um, atmospheric gases like water vapor and oxygen, same in this region. And I want to do this where you have a window in the atmosphere, same as 1732. So we make that where you have to also clean the data by doing a correction. You simply use the data you gather in space at the top of the atmosphere, and without any corrections, you can easily identify different features. Here we were looking at a landfill where you have plastic materials as well, and you see nicely how it uh, how do you say, like it maps or shows the plastic material. And then here you have a water, processor. they have a tank here, uh, uh, not a tank, but uh, a small dam or a lake, you'd say, or tank, yeah, which is it. But it's uh, it's covered on plastic, with plastic. Here, rooftops from the factories and the brewery here. And then some areas, of course, vegetation. You remember I say that vegetation is a hydrocarbon, so you see some Features are highlighted here. These are like here, the vegeta vegetated area here. But of course, the plastic material where you expect, that's the red part. Um, also, we investigated the differences between the dry plastics. So we are measuring dry plastics and wet plastics. So one thing you have to understand, water is a great absorber of light. And therefore, if you're going to measure the dry plastics and wet plastics, you see differences. So if you look at the signal here, this is of the wet plastics. It's, if you look at the, now if you look, remember I said we identify things by shape or magnitude. So here, if you look at the absorption of the light, and then of course the shape also varies slightly due to other contributions by the water itself. So there's always an issue of measuring, like if you're going, if, if you're going to measure dry or wet material. So on land, it's going to be quite easy. The signal is very high, but if you're going to measure plastics in water, then yeah, you likely get a lower signal. So you need a higher signal to noise ratio in your sensors. So the summary, in summary we, may, we measure the properties from the UV to the short wave infrared from 350. 2,500 nanometers, and 
established a mean spectral signal for marine harvested microplastics? There's a question. Uh, uh, ah, yes, so uh, agreed. So the same uh, as you generate, you know, vegetation indices, uh, you have the normalized uh, NDVI, normalized difference vegetation index, water indexes, same thing. That's what we simply did here with the, with the uh, hydrocarbon index. So you have, I, I should have included the, the a schematic of how we do it. You, uh, you need three bands, three wave bands. You identify the depth, band depth index or you simply use a ratio. So these are different uh, approaches to do that. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Um, then we explored airborne remote sensing of synthetic hydrocarbons where we do the mapping and be sure that, you know, like the dry plastics had higher reflectance compared to wet plastics. And so here, this was done on land. And now we went out to the open ocean. So in this study, we were sensing ocean plastics using also an airborne sensor measuring in the shortwave infrared. And this exercise was done in the Pacific Ocean. So here's a map of the area covered. So in the Pacific Ocean, like towards Hawaii. And we used um, like an, uh, it's called the Lockerhead Hercules C-130. It's an old refurbished plane. And it was flying at an altitude of 400 meters at 140 knots and survey time for each day, like on 2nd of October and 6th of October was two and a half hours. So this activity was um, sponsored by the ocean cleanup and its donors. And on the, on the plane, there were several instruments, like several instruments uh, on the side, on the sides of the plane, there was an opening. There were two scientists, like trained scientists who were looking at the water column. I did it like visually identifying different types of plastics. Well, not the types, but shapes and yeah, counting them. And then in the back here, you, there were sensors. There was an RGB camera, uh, 16 megapixel camera measuring at 10 by 10 centimeter pixels. And then there was also like an image, a hyperspectral imager measuring at like 50 centimeters by 1.2 meters. And then there was also a LiDAR sensor. And the RGB images, these were like some of the major groups of items that were observed, containers, boats, um, ghost nets, like ghost nets. These are generally like fishing nets that end up just being lost at sea. They also have lost ghost nets. Here they are bundled up with material. Of course, when you have breaking waves and there are other material, they just end up being bungled. And same thing with what happens with entangled uh, with uh, mammals, seas, or even like whales. And then you have ropes, nautical ropes, and the other pieces were just not identified. So most of the parameters that were um, recorded were color, shape, uh, and sizes. So, and then when we look at the signal, one thing that was clear, of course, the highest signal is the floating part, which we assume is relatively dry. And looking at those spectral features we had identified in the lab, at 12, uh, 1,215 meters and 1,732 nanometers here highlighted. You observe, you have those values, those small values or the absorption features. And one other aspect was the floating part at their highest signal here highlighted in this image. And then the submerged part, we don't know how far it was submerged, but it was below the water. The signal is relatively lower. You remember in the lab, we had also discovered that the highest signal plastics, then of course, background, which is the seawater, yes, now in the blue, and then the pink magenta color shows this part and floating part. So, how you do the approach, you like the vegetables, uh, how you calculate them. So you can either do a continuum re removal using the rise or latent data, whichever you use. That in both scenarios, and then where
and then you add calculate the deal from the continuum line to correspond and then the values you can evaluate a in, you know, like if you look at the peak of coverage, you can always try to do some mixing of the seawater and the 100% pixel coverage signal of the plastic. And then with the different coverages, you can always calculate the band depth, trying to see if you can do this or not to do it. So um, we identified special features that are unique to plastics. We, we could observe them without doing any atmospheric correction. Because, you know, one time of doing atmospheric correction, uh, scientists have come up with different assumptions, and it's always difficult to say if you have gone through data, then it's quite simple. You can always do reference and say this is most accurate approach. But then a ground truth is always difficult to get. But here we also showed, you know, like the potential application of airborne hyperspectral sensors. And well, we also show here, like, well, I think about it for a second, you know, like we show the advantage of remote sensing, not from just this um, five hours sensing using um, a plane, we covered an area of 11 square kilometers. But then if you're going to do net throws, um, in the best case scenario, 30 minutes with a net, which is one by 0 0.5 opening, like one by and then 50 centimeters, like the, uh, how do you say it? Two knots, you only cover an area of 0 0.00. Something to just think about the advantage of using remote sensing over doing field service. Of course, with field service, you get more information, more data. But then from a plane, the area coverage is very high. And then now imagine if you're going to use a satellite, then of course, yeah, the it's less, right? Um, I'll just try to think is we lost that part. If you're going to natural size and the one point one area you cover compared to this area. Okay, we are back again. I hope everyone can see my screen. I'll just continue. Um, so one of the it just came out, uh, the paper just came out and um Happy to announce. Here we, okay, yeah. Well, we are back again. <laughs> um, so one of the uh, like one of the last studies I'm happy to share with you is a study that also explores the use of world UV. So this is um, high geospatial resolution satellite with multi-spectral wave bands. So limited number of bands, like around eight in the uh, visible uh, in the visible to infrared region, eight in the infrared, like in near infrared. And this can get best, like 30 by 30 meter resolution. Uh, was on and here we came up with a simplified algorithm that was based on removing the signal in the green wave bands and removing that from the near infrared signal. And this was easy, like it easily highlighted the plastic material in the image. And here you notice like we took a transect here. So from the transect, you see here highlighted are the points where we know this is actually plastic. So the, the pile or the system that is collecting plastics here in the open ocean is made out of plastic as well. So here we look at the anomalies that are based on the algorithm we developed. And based on those anomalies, you see here it it is very high, very high here. These are the ends of the transect where you know this is actually plastic. So our assumption here is all the other anomalies you identify here, or like if you look 
at the differences that are measured here at the bottom. Like, so you'd expect wherever you have these anomalies or anything above zero in the anomaly is a suspected plastic. So here we highlight also some of the other features we identified as like bigger pieces, which are easy to identify by human eye. And yeah, just to give you that impression, like what I was explaining, the transect is here. And then here you, if you look at this map or anomaly map we created here, you have these items are green. And of course, uh, the bluish and reddish items are close to the um, measuring pile. So any values that you see closer to red or from green, blue, like light blue towards reddish, these are the uh, pinging or like uh, anomalies where we are seeing, we, are, we notice the plastics. So we created a, a proxy map that you can use, or rather a heat map of where you find suspected plastics and we verify the algorithm by the known plastics, which is the PIO system here. And when we look at the spectral signature of the different uh, items in the, in the image, of course, as expected, the white clouds have a signal. And then you have the system, like the bright part of the system that is here. So as expected, the plastics have generally a higher signal than the seawater. And then, of course, if you look at the seawater and the cloud, well, cloud shadow and seawater, they have the lowest signal. And then suspected plastics, which we identified here, they, are, they have a higher signal than the water system compared to um, uh, from the system compared to the water uh, surface background. Was yeah, of course, the water is absorbing most of the light, right? Same here, we look at the reflectance at the top of the atmosphere without doing an atmospheric correction. The system, the bright parts, these bright parts, of course, the dark parts, these are the parts we, we, we have some shadow. Of course, this is always like contribution of light to the shadowed parts is lower compared to the bright parts where you have the less cloud shadow if you look at the signal. So here, the bright uh, system bright, the bright part of the system is has the highest signal. And then the other suspected plastics they have, you see, if you remember when we were saying, how do you compare, um, how do you identify or describe the signal? It's the shape. If you look at the shape, it's similar. The magnitude is different, but then the shape is similar. That's what we can say in, in this uh, image. Um, some of the sea truth information we collected near the cleaning system here as uh, examples of the new system, but the old system, you know, like you see some items are, in, some are floating and these are the recent pictures, but these are from 2018, just close to the time when we obtained the satellite image. Um, another study, which is more, more technical, uh, we want to understand, you know, like, uh, is the reflectance signal you get going to be affected by the amount of plastics in the in the in the in the region of where you are measuring or the pixel? So, if you are going to look at one pixel, like a box, right? If you have a plastic coverage of 100 percent, would the signal be the same as the plastic was 50 percent? And we also try to understand if you look. At the plastic, if you're measuring the reflectance at different angles, would you expect to get different signal or is the same signal, right? And then do some modeling to try to understand from lab measurements, can we simulate or try to model how the satellite or a satellite would be giving the signal of the different plastics at different concentrations. And here in this study, we had different samples like HDPE, LDPE, polypropylene, polystyrene, um, high density polyethylene, like density. And then these materials like um, in here are similar to other, like the samples that are collected in the Great Pacific garbage patch. And then you, we also had, these are new plastics. So these polymers are new materials. And then we had some materials that were biofouled, which had like organisms or like surfacants on the surface. And they were also collected in the Pacific patch. And here are the like examples of, you see here, there's a rope which was collected in the ocean. Pellets, the small sized plastics, right? And 
when we were looking at the pixel concentration, we did a very high resolution, like, um, how do you say, like uh, division of the different uh, concentrations. We looked at a concentration of 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 1, 10%, 20%, 40%, all the way to 100%. So here, when we were calculating the reflectance of the plastic, we had a background, which is black. You remember the other measurements we saw here. What we did, we did our best to make sure the background is black and the signal or contribution of light from the black background is in most cases negligible, but then of course you have to measure the background to just always be accurate in your calculations. So you get the total signal and from the total signal, you try to remove this contribution of the background. So if your background is 50% in your pixel, you try to remove from the total signal you're measuring from your sensor, that contribution of the background. And we had like, a, how do you say, an artificial light. We did some measurements outdoors and some measurements indoors due to weather conditions. And the first step was always to take an image. So when you take the image, you know exactly what, like, because we know where the sensor was looking at. So it, you're looking with um, with our sensor, it is a secular area coverage. That's why that's the region you're covering here. And in this area, we try to identify what concentration is plastic and what concentration is the background. That's how we managed to do the calcula accurate calculations indicated here. And most of the work like with the imagery analysis was done in QGIS, QGIS and Python. <laughs> And going into the results, what we discovered is there was well relatively moderate to very strong positive relationships between pixel coverage and spectral reflectance. So here, just an example of the different wavelengths at 850, at 1215, and 1732. We know like the different colors here. Blue is for the 850 nanometers, green is for the 1215, and red is for 1732. Mm -hmm. And if you look closely, like in most scenarios, you notice that the more concentration of the plastics you have in a pixel, the higher the reflectance you observe at a different wavelength. But this was only uh, applicable at zero degrees in India when you are looking directly below the target. Similar here, we, we didn't really see um, a different, like how do you say, there was, um, it was unclear the relationship between the viewing angle and the reflectance. But what we noticed is you would have the highest reflectance when you're measuring at Nadia, like looking directly at the sample. Um, here, so reflectance at Nadia with maximum pixel coverage for the wet and ocean hazard plastics. Reflectance decreased once samples are wet. So polystyrene remains very bright. So this is one of the results we, we identified. So here the differences are wet or dry. Obviously we confirm what we've also previously done like wet materials would have lower reflectance. And then um, we looked at uh, other materials, ocean hazardous plastics. We tried to match them to, you remember we create, um, uh, we tried to create a library so if you don't know what material it is, you can easily compare them and also identifying the different features where you find the different features. Reported before, we had samples from Hawaii and the new samples, you'd find the valleys and the absorption features, they are mm -hmm. identical. So different samples, but same conclusion, right? If you're looking only in the shortwave infrared region, you see here, the valley appears here. If you look at the dropped lines, they match nicely with uh, different uh, for the different samples. So pellets from Hawaii, and these are pellets for well, same region, Pacific Ocean, but different, yeah, different time of sampling. And also, again, if you look at the ocean harvested samples, the the valleys also appear in the same regions as before. Yeah. Um, so there's always a question like, well, color really matter? The apparent color, the visible. Here we um, showed that you know, like the color of the actual sample does matter. 
if your sample like this is at 100% pixel coverage, look at these two 100% pixel. If you have white and blue, uh, the white and blue is the 100%. This is the blue line. The signal is relatively lower compared to the black dots where you, you have combination of different colors. So here you have the higher signal. Of course, there's a contribution that you see it's supposed to be straight because white is generally, you see that the white pieces, they are generally flat in the visible, but because of the blue uh, samples, you have the peak in the blue region that contributes to this peak. But if you look at the sample here, it's 100%. This is almost 100% as well. These are multicolored. The signal is relatively lower, even if it's 100%. So what we concluded is the color of the samples does matter. It also contributes to the uh, magnitude. You remember we talked about magnitude? The magnitude also is affected when you're looking at samples of different colors. Um, yeah, I think one thing before we conclude, I think we're just over time. Uh, we have also done some studies using drones and with the drone data, we have applied uh, neural networks, artificial intelligence, and using just simplified RGB imagery, we have come up with different models like to classify the plastics and also quantify the plastics. So I think here we can end and let's see what else is coming up. Yeah. Use of drones in the open ocean. There are some studies that have been published related to that. Um, here are some just some images of yeah drone imagery captured uh, in the Pacific Ocean, where you see material accumulating on the cleaning system. Some uh, some quick results from AI, where it's uh, automatically identifying bigger pieces of plastics. And then just some, yeah, some nice pictures here to show a ghost net which has been collected. And you have like some fish, mai mai, well, moving away from a ghost net. I guess, yeah, that's the end for today. Ah, so if you are interested, there's a project which is being run in Greece. They have, they put out plastic targets. So that's also a nice uh, data set that you can use if you are, interested in remote sensing of uh, plastics using satellite imagery. That's the data is open access. Yes, so thank you for your time. And I think, and I hope you have gained some knowledge about remote sensing ocean instruments and plastics. And I also have to thank all the uh, contributors to my, my funding and different agencies that have supported my work, but Anyway, thank you, and it was fun providing some knowledge, some expertise I have. And yeah, if there are no questions, I wish you all the best, and hopefully see you around. Thank you.